all of the issues that we're facing in terms of big global problems depend on our engagement with the emerging economies as well as our own technical technological leadership and innovation. And there's a nexus of three huge global challenges that we have to deal with, all of which are under huge, huge stress. And they are the intersection of food, energy, and water. Food, with the population increases. And you know, we have huge demographic shifts as well. The United States, thank goodness, we should all be thankful for this, is the only developed country in the world that has a growing population. Very important for our future. But food, with expected population increase, we're going to have to increase global food production 50% by 2030 and perhaps 70% by 2050. Think about that. And much of the world's arable land is already in use. Remaining land has serious soil and terrain constraints. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about food going forward. And water, that's vital for life, agriculture, all industrial development. Today, we have about 1 billion people who don't even have safe drinking water. And by 2025, 2.8 billion people will be water scarce or stressed. Water is the new oil. Food and water will be the national security issues before we know it. And then you bring in energy. You know, from the time we became human beings, we have had to have energy. You cannot have any human activity without energy. And energy, of course, is at the heart of environmental stewardship, climate issues, the huge demand and consumption coming from the growth in the uh, emerging world. You know, everyone's talking about, and I have all this data if you want it, uh, the council, you know, the, what's going on in the clean energy space in China. But let's not forget, you know, China's putting on massive coal-fired plants almost every day. The demand for this energy is voracious all over the world. And so you can't talk about energy independence. It's really energy security and how nations are going to access in a clean, affordable way a portfolio of energy to meet their needs going forward. The sixth shift is that we have a multi-science and technology world, multipolar. And so most of the countries that I've been talking about, the uh, BRICS, now they have the civets. Has everybody heard the new word, the civets? They include, in addition to the BRICS, um, countries such as Indonesia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, etc. They're all thinking, how can we be innovators? How can we invest in R&D? So in you know, 1960, the U.S. accounted for more than two-thirds of global R&D. Uh, today, two-thirds of global R&D is performed out somewhere else in the United States. China's raised uh, up to number three in global R&D spending. And there's no guarantee that the game-changing science and technology innovations are going to originate, originate in the United States. Now, I was just recently uh, talking about the uh, World Economic Forum's competitiveness survey, which um, has, you know, very interesting, strange data results in that they place Tunisia 20 times above Brazil in global competitiveness. And, you know, just intuitively, I think we all know that's not quite there. And Saudi Arabia is ahead of Korea, but we won't, we don't need to go there this morning. But I did make this point. We spend more, we spend a billion dollars more on R&D than the entire EU. We spend three times more than China. It's about $450 billion in R&D. But what we're looking at are the trends and how that relates to GDP and things. So the trends are shifting elsewhere, but thank goodness we still have this collective consensus for this huge investment in the United States. So what does all this mean, these quick shifts that I've gone through? And, and there's some others, but these were the ones I wanted to highlight. Well, the first is that there's an economic earthquake underway that's causing major tension throughout our society and our political narrative. It's reflected in our national anxiety about economic security, job loss, you know, do we have free or fair trade, all of the things on the trade front, offshoring, this rise of China, you know, what's going on on the currency uh, issue, and there's no question China's currency has to be dealt with. 
And even more scary, what's going on in China with things like uh, the event two weeks ago, I believe, when they purposely rammed a Japanese um, vessel in the, in, the, you know, in the South China Sea. And when the Japanese picked that uh, captain up, as you recall, what did the Chinese do? They said, we're going to cut off your supply of rare earth minerals. That's really a very serious statement because all the things we're talking about on the technological frontiers depend on rare earth minerals. Good news is our Department of Energy has accelerated with the Defense Department a massive effort now to really identify, not just in the U.S. and Canada, but where else these rare earth minerals are. But this is what's causing this tremendous uh, fault lines right now, not just in the United States, but in Europe and elsewhere. So we can't keep or replicate the advantages of emerging economies, such as low wages, commodity goods, routine technology development, or standard services. We're never going to create more scientists and engineers than China or India. Think about that. If they had a strategy that every one of their citizens was a trained scientist and engineer, just by population's numbers, we can't do that. And let's not forget that at the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union had the highest number of scientists and engineers in the world, and they hardly had any kind of a competitive economy. Educating and training our people to compete against computers or low-wage workers overseas is just a non-starter. And excellence in science and technology alone is not going to ensure our success because, again, everybody else is building this up. So this links us back to what we're talking about here. Knowledge, information, and technology are increasingly commodities and accessible globally. The rewards are not going to necessarily go to those who have a lot of these things. The rewards are going to go to the countries, the companies, the regions, the individuals who know what to do with these building blocks once they get them. And so for the United States, what matters most are the imagination, the ideas, the creativity, and the ability to turn this into real things of value. So in 2005, right after our National Innovation Initiative, we did our definition of innovation. And um, you know, I'll, I'll share it with you. you know, we love to, the council to keep coming up with these nice little ways of expressing complex things. But it very much aligns with what um, the Imagination Initiative is here. And that is that innovation is, the in, is eye to the fifth power. It's the intersection of ideas, imagination, insight, invention, and impact. And it is all about how you knit that all together for the transformational value. So the real question for our government leaders, for our state leaders, all of us as citizens, is not how we're going to shore up the last days of the industrial age, but how are we going to build a creation nation to turbocharge innovation that can deliver the jobs and prosperity that we need and want for our standard of living, for our security, and for the global commons. Now, let me turn to a little bit of the positive side. And this is what you know, makes me very happy and excited every day with my work. We have entered an age of tremendous opportunity. It's really the age of innovation. We are on the cusp of a profound scientific and technological revolution. In fact, we're not really on the cusp, we're in it. And that is this merger of the digital, biotechnological, and nanotechnology revolutions. And these revolutions are rewriting the rules of production and services in digital code, genetic code, and atomic code. They're game changing. They're going to unleash vast opportunities. And they're going to be the only way to solve these grand global challenges I mentioned, food, water, energy, and how this impacts our environment. The most powerful codes may be four letters, A, T, C, and G, the programming language of life. The cost of DNA sequencing has fallen through the floor, down a hundred thousandth in a decade. A drop steeper than the decreases in the cost of computing power. And I, I just got this number and I was stunned. It took 13 years and almost three billion to sequence the first human genome. In a few years, it's likely that we're going to sequence a human genome in 15 minutes for about $1,000. This changes everything 
in the biotechnology business. It's going to unleash the innovation in sectors from health service, pharmaceuticals, agriculture, energy, materials, manufacturing, virtually everything. And again, if you turn to this state, you have for many, many years been at the cusp of leading and deploying and capturing the value in this whole health, biotech, IT, all of that coming together. Not just with great companies like Eli Lilly, but also the medical devices and the whole cluster that surrounds that. And I would add the fact that you're a major agricultural producer. So the whole agricultural plant science issue and what's going to happen with next generation biofuels, all of those things are linked together. So, you know, you look at the digital revolution, and I've alluded to this, but we're going to have ubiquitous computing, and it's going to stretch again across every human activity. We've been doing tremendous work at the Council on Competitiveness since 2003 around how we get the power of supercomputing into the hands of entrepreneurs and suppliers. And I will just foreshadow this because it's something you might all want to look into. I know Purdue's involved in some others, but there's a potential for a major pilot a high-performance computing pilot that we are leading with the White House on how to take computational capability that we have at the petaflop level and link together our universities, our big companies, the, the deers, the caterpillars at all with the supplier base and do that in the Midwest and actually look at this pilot as one that will be scalable to the rest of the country. You know, nanotechnology, again, Everything from, you know, electronic, structural, medicinal. Uh, I'll give you an example that I love is, you know, at the nano level, being able to um, have a flexible suit that hardens when impacted by a knife or a bullet or compresses around a wound. The, the, the already the things we're fielding in the nano uh, arena are unbelievable. And this ties in to biomimicry which is now we're really being able to show that nature is displacing the machine as the model of design. Wind turbines are being inspired by whale fins, strong, lightweight steel sheets inspired by bird bones. Qualcomm's latest Mirasol display mimics the way the butterfly's wings and peacock feathers cause light to interfere with itself, creating iridescent colors. Sharklet Technologies, a wonderful, uh, small, innovative company that's going like gangbusters, now has antimicrobial films being used in our hospitals that have millions of tiny diamond-shaped patterns that mimic the microbe-resistant properties of a shark skin. And researchers in DARPA and elsewhere are working on adhesives that mimic those of sea worms and barnacles that are going to be create now adhesives that work in wet environments. So instead of sutures after surgery, these adhesive, adhesives inside the body will work in a wet environment and immediately seal. Your Japanese official comes to see me and he says, we have to deal with the four Ds. And he keeps talking about these four Ds and I'm wondering, what are the four Ds? And I finally have the courage to ask him and he said, manufacturing, it's not dirty, dumb, dangerous and disappearing. So that, you know, that many years ago, there was a understanding that not only was manufacturing in a state of huge transition, but that people didn't understand in terms of career paths and the importance what manufacturing actually was going to be. And today, we know at the U.S. Council on Competitiveness, and there are many examples I could share with you from flat panel displays where we invented every single display, past, present, and future, but we've never made a one of them and lost all the wealth and the jobs, that you cannot divorce the manufacturing wrap from the innovation itself. And you marry that realization to the fact that we now have 3D printing that is customizing manufacturing 